Well, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for in inviting me to this meeting. Um, I've actually to say that I was quite excited about, uh, I'm, I, jo I joined in yesterday and today, and I have to say that I really um, would like to thank you once more for inviting me as someone who is a lot older than you to this uh, young uh, investigators meeting. And it really reminded me of my own career, which I think I will uh, go through very quickly because uh, Chantal asked me to at least introduce myself properly in terms of my own career. And I think there are perhaps two messages from my career one can take, which is actually quite long and a bit convoluted. So I don't want to go through all the details. All I want to say is that uh, things usually don't go as you plan. And this actually can be quite exciting. So, I mean, I didn't plan out to become a senior scientist very early on. I wanted to become a high school teacher but uh, have some experience in research. And then when I did my own PhD work, uh, my first two projects completely failed. And I decided if this is science, you know, I just scraped together something in the end to get my degree. And I said, well, I mean, okay, that's it for me. But then thinking about being a high school teacher for the next 35 or 40 years, I thought at least I want to have some, some different experience in my life. So I decided to postdoc uh, at Rockefeller at that time with uh, Paul Greengard, who later won the Nobel Prize. And then I really, I have to say that I caught on and got excited about research. Anyway, so then I went back to Germany and uh, very different from Charmista. My first position was a pure research position. It was actually reasonably well funded. I needed to apply for grants, but had no teaching at this point. So I was in much better shape. Uh, administration support was great. So I had this great uh, time in that during that period, but it was very clear if I didn't make it, it was I was only to blame myself. I mean, I could not, you know, use any kind of excuse to say, well, there were these university problems and the lab problems because everything was well set up. So the downside was that I had only five years because these positions were at that time five years uh, with a very difficult um, possibility of perhaps extending it for one year. So I had to basically make it and uh, it was really, it was fantastic. So I could um, start my own group. But at the end of these five years, I needed to find another slot, another position. I was applying for jobs and I ended to go back to the United States for a second time. At this time, as, uh, at Yale University, as an associate and full professor of his tenure, I was actually, uh, it shows you how, how good these positions are that after five years after the postdoc, I was able to get tenure at Yale, which normally takes eight or nine years. So that was uh, showing you how, how, how ideal these conditions were. And then, you know, I, I just want to do this very quickly. After six years, I was lured back to Germany. So now I'm now at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen. And uh, then my actually, so I more or less spent my time in research institutions. I had some teaching at Yale University, but it was not much. And my real, let's say, hard experience with universities came very late here, but I don't want to go into this in any detail. So about my research on very briefly, uh, so I was lucky, I have to say, in my research to be in the front row when major scientific breakthroughs were made in the late 80s and 90s of last century, which I would like to refer to as a molecular revolution, the presynapse. And I myself set out to take apart the synaptic vesicle as a starting point to unravel protein networks and supermolecular machines, in particular for the final steps in calcium-mediated exocytosis. And at that time, I actually recruited two friends whom I met beforehand as in my student and postdoc times, Pietro de Camilli and Tom Sidov to, to join me in this effort. So as uh, Charmista mentioned, collaborations are very important. They turned to be, uh, out to be instrumental because between the three of us, we're really able to make major progress. In particular, Tom then went on and uh, characterized a whole slew of more proteins. And I'm very glad that he in the end then was actually making, making it to his Nobel Prize. Anyway, so my, the topic of my presentation today is actually different. I would like to talk a little bit about good scientific practice. Now, the opposite of good scientific practice is scientific misconduct. And let me just briefly for the matter of clarification, define that. And this is a definition which is actually used by the NIH and the American institutions. And I just copied because it's you know very similar everywhere. So research misconduct is defined as fabrication, falsification of plagiarism, in proposing, performing, or reviewing research or in reporting research results. Now, fabrication is making up data or results and recording or reporting them. Falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. 
And plagiarism, you all know, is the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Now, most of you probably believe that this issue will never affect you in a professional life. And indeed, falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism are relatively rare, even though there are famous cases. And let me just give you one brief example, which was for Germany, was actually like hit Germany like a bombshell almost 20 years ago. And that case in particular was then the starting point for installing and implementing rules for good scientific practice at every institution in Germany, every scientific institution, which are now mandatory and need to be obeyed to by all uh, uh, faculty members in these institutions. Now this, I give you just one example. This is actually a Northern, a Southern blot of an experiment in which it was tested whether antisense RNA or a specific ribosome was, would knock out one of three factors, factor A, factor B, factor C, the details don't matter. And you see that here in this case, the result looks very clean in the sense that the antisense oligo hits factor A, but it does not hit the expression of factor B and C. And similarly, you see the same with the ribozyme where this was also abolished. So this looks fine and okay. And if you look at the figure more closely, you might realize that there is something fishy here because it looks like that this band was cut and that these kind of fields were more or less fused together to make it appear if, if they were run on the same gel. However, a closer inspection of this figure revealed the following that this was actually completely invented in a sense. You see that these three bands, they are the same as here. These three bands were copied here and they were also copied here and the same applies to here. So this is a clearly completely faked result. And it was a big case, it was a big professor. It was a big scandal, you know, big investigation committees. And uh, finally the responsible scientists, senior professors lost their jobs. And I think correctly so. Now, there are obviously rules to prevent this, and I would like to just summarize very briefly, and I'm not sure about the situation in India, in which way you have institutional rules. I'm quite sure you do have them. So institutional rules for good scientific practice are implemented across, you know, in the US and in Germany and in Europe, in Western Europe. They affect everything, data handling, storage, and good scientific practice. And we also have mandatory courses in good scientific practice. And as a dean of a graduate school, some 15 years ago, I actually made them mandatory for all graduate students. And these were courses as a dean of the school I taught by myself for a long time because I thought, I mean, someone with my experience and someone with some seniority should actually be the one to teach these courses. Now, there are also report systems. If, for instance, one of the students or a young scientists realizes something is fishy and doesn't dare to tell the supervisors they have very much dependencies. You are dependent on your boss for career progression. So there are these kind of whistleblower protection. There is an ombud system in place. So there are uh, mechanisms uh, implemented to make sure that such complaints can be clearly voiced without uh, having to be afraid of disadvantages or let's say without, let's say bad mouthing publicly someone who in the end may, not, may be innocent. So these are both possibilities. But what are the sanctions institutions it can actually re and start disciplinary measures. This can actually end up with immediate termination of employment. So universities can and research institutions can fire people if they have done gross scientific misconduct. And there are also penalties from the from the granting institution, like in the United States, there's this uh, Office of Research Integrity in the U.S., which investigates all NIH-funded uh, complaints and. There may be actually penalties such as back, back payment of grants or ban of future funding and so on. Now, scientific journals have their own set. So they're now becoming increasingly strict. And you might have noticed this when you publish papers about data handling. So they want to know exactly how the data were collected. Very often, you have to have, a, let's say, raw data being provided by the journals in order to allow, um, let's say, if you have compound figures to really go back to the original data. And uh, many journals now do forensic kind of unquote unquote analysis of all accepted data in particular figures. I'll show you an example of that. And obviously the sanctions are, if something is wrong, there has to be an erratum or corrigendum or even a retraction has been published. Now the scientific community also has taken the general public measures. There's obviously public reporting of suspicious publications. There are websites like Papier. In India, you have the Society of Scientific Values which I found on the internet, which seems to be, um, uh, to me, to be one of those institutions that actually define standards of good scientific practice. There's also public reporting of uh, retractions. There's a 
web page retraction watch, which is very closely monitored by a lot of people, and they are very accurate and very solid, and they actually have uncovered a bunch of cases. And obviously, the sanctions are loss of reputation and public shaming. And because if you lose your good reputation as a scientist, obviously, this is uh, uh, damaging your career quite severely. Now, as mentioned, these cases are relatively rare. And this is why I don't want to really spend any more time on them. But scientific misconduct is not limited to these misdemeanors. And good scientific practice is a lot more than just avoiding scientific, scientific misconduct. And now I'm getting a little bit closer to home. Now, in a study published in, nine, in 2005 in Nature, uh, they reported about a questionnaire which they sent to several thousand early and mid-career scientists in the US. So they were all NIH funded. And these investigators were asked to report about their own behavior in the last three years. So you would assume, well, I mean, everyone wants to look good, but they just said it's anonymous. You can report very honestly what you have done. And we are asking you a bunch of questions, which I'll show, share you with in a minute. And the outcome was actually quite alarming, I have to say. And what I concluded is that our findings reveal a range of questionable practices that are striking in their breadth and prevalence. Now, evidence suggests that mundane, regular misbehaviors present greater threats to the scientific enterprise than those caused by high profile misconduct cases, fraud cases, and these type of things. So, what I'm talking about here. Now, this is a questionnaire uh, which was sent out, and this is the, the, uh, the results here. And let me just go through with you through some of these points. Well, the first is falsifying and cooking research data. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very rare thing, but even now, you realize that an average of 0.3% of all questions, and this means with 3,000, quite a few already, admitted by themselves that in the last three years, they have actually done this. It's a bit, I think it's a little bit unsettling. Now, let me just go over these uh, next four points, but rather actually move to the next to, to point five, six, seven, eight, and nine, because I think they're actually quite interesting. Well, the next one is, Using another uh, someone else's ideas without obtaining permission or giving you credit. Now here we hit already single digits, and you see that here we have early career, mid career. Uh, I mean, this is already uh, one or two in a hundred admitted to have done this in the last three years. Now, what this might this mean? Well, think about the following case. Um, you're stuck, let's say, as a student or as a young investigator, postdoc, you're stuck with an experiment. You just work for two, three months, you have a problem you can't solve, and you're trying this and this and that, and it doesn't work, and you're really frustrated. You go to the cafeteria, and you meet an old friend you haven't seen in a long time, perhaps someone from grad school or whatever, you know, and you, you discuss this, well, hey, I have this goddamn problem, I don't really know what to do with this. And then your friend says, oh, why don't you try this and this and this? And you say, fine, okay, thanks. You go away, you never see this guy again, and boom, bingo, pay dirt, this hint solves a problem. Now you wind up publishing a paper and well, what about this person's credit? I mean, are you allowed to use this information? These are things you have to think about. Now, the next point, unauthorized use of confidential information in connection with one's own research. Actually here you see already a bit of a, increase, which you might ask, well, what the hell is this? Now, here also, you see a big difference between mid-career and early career scientists. Now, what is the reason for this? The reason is very simple. Because as a senior scientist or mid-career scientist, you are increasingly asked to review grants, to review papers. And then suddenly, you might be in the position of information which you get as a referee, but which you should not disclose to anyone. Now, you might say, well, this is self-understood. But to give you an example from my own career, so this was in the days when before the internet, so you got the review request, not by email, but you got a thick brown envelope, which included the paper, and they didn't really ask you about whether you wanted to review this or not. Anyway, so, so I had a, I was, we were working on a project and the student was stuck and I was giving this and this and that advice. And I get a paper to review, which exactly contained the information we were trying to get. So I was stuck. I mean, nowadays I would not review the paper, would say it's a conflict of interest, but at that time I had it in my hand. I had this information, what do I do? I mean, that's a bad situation. I mean, if I use this information, obviously I'm violating the rules of good scientific practice because I'm not supposed to, to use this information at all. On the other hand, if I'm not telling my student, I cannot look you know, with, a, with a good conscience to see this student wasting time and money on a problem which I know 
is actually futile and uh, he or she should move away from this. So this was a really tough situation for me and it shows you how easily you can wind up in, in such a tight spot without even actually um, um, actually intending to do this. And I, so I kind of chicken out a little bit by steering the student away from the problem and try to focus on something else, you know, which was a bit, you know, uh, uh, an emergency solution, not a, an optimal one, but still, I mean, I wanted to avoid the, this particular conflict. Now the next point, failing to present data that contradict one's own previous research. Now you would say as a young investigator, look, if I do something, I have a result and I find out later it's wrong, I should, should be up, up, uh, upfront about it, right? Now again, um, an example of my own career. So when I was a young a group leader and we had actually done uh, some very interesting work at a very good student, it was dealing with the dissociation of a small GTPAs from synaptic vesicles during excitation, details don't matter. It was something which was everyone was looking for at the time and the data were robust. We did the experiments backwards, forwards. I was standing right next to her. It was really very solid. In the end, we published it in Nature. Now, this was my first Nature publication back in the, in the uh, early 90s, late 80s. And it was certainly one of the contributors that got me these top jobs in the US, I mean, in, in, in the end at Yale University. And so we moved, the student joined me, wanted to complete a few things. And when we started to repeat the experiment, the effect was gone. So we got still nice stimulation, but no dissociation. One month, two months, student trying everything. And I said, God damn shit, what do I do now? I mean, this, was, this paper was instrumental for me to get that job. And I was facing the situation. I may have to, to admit that this result cannot be reproduced. So in the end, I was facing the extremely unpleasant situation of writing a retraction of that particular paper. Now, fortunately, the story had a happy end uh, because a uh, new postdoc joined the lab. He started taking up the experiment and bingo, it worked again. And then obviously we were in a good position to find out what the reasons were. I don't wanna go into the details. So we were in the end able to settle that and we included these problems in the next paper. But fortunately in this case, with the, with the happy outcome. Now, number nine, due to the lack of time, I don't want to go in. It is actually that you are sometimes very benign and not so critical if you are collaborating with someone who presents you with data which fit to your own theory, even you you have the gut feeling, uh, is this really properly done or not? Now, from the next point, again, due to the lack of time, let me just uh, single out one issue, inappropriately assigning authorship credit. Now, in all fights and disagreements in science, this is by far the number one cause, you know, fights about authorship. Nothing is worse. Nothing can destroy friendships, partnerships, and, 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 and more than this particular issue. Now, when I come back to the example of the young the student or your friend you met in the cafeteria uh, who gave you this idea, that is something you need to consider because essentially, um, Authorship means that you have to have given a significant scientific contribution to the work. Now, if someone got you out of a methodical problem which you couldn't solve by a good hint, this is definitely qualifies as a significant scientific contribution. So by these rules, this person should at least ask to be on the uh, co-author of the paper. On the other hand, just running a big lab, getting money and having your people doing their work without even getting involved doesn't entitle you as a senior author on the paper unless you really have given significant sign of input. So it goes both ways. And I think the best way out of the conundrum is always, always, always make sure before you even submit a paper or even finalize it to make sure that everyone who has been involved knows who is on the paper and is not. And if there are any conflicts, gets them settled beforehand because it's a lot easier than after the fact is the fire, the paper is published, and then you have all these type of problems. Now, let me move on with a few um, quick examples, um, which again, I want to be quick because of the lack of time. Now, plagiarism is something you might assume, well, this is a problem that may affect humanities, but it's not an issue in experimental life science. Well, I have to say it's wrong. I can tell you as a former dean of graduate school, I've experienced quite a few cases of plagiarism, which include copy pasting paragraphs of even entire sections, including references from reviews and introductions. In two cases, there were students while I was in the thesis committee and they were dumb enough to copy these parts from my own reviews. And I mean, I have to say that was, they thought they wouldn't be caught. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it was inadvertent. It was a mishandling, God knows what. I mean, so copying text from websites. And there's also what we have seen, it's actually a more difficult case 
you write the thesis, you have a thesis in the same lab, which really goes through a lot of work to, to describe the methods with all the references. Now, the next student uses the, next, the same methods and just copies the page from the previous thesis. And that's obviously the case, which is borderline. You have to think about how to solve that one again, uh, something to, for you to consider. There are various ways, oops, there are various ways to, to prevent this. Obviously, it has to be part of the education of the students in the good scientific practice courses. Nowadays, uh, actually, some institutions, including ours, now use antiplarism software to search for, for text identity. And there's obviously also public shaming. And in Germany, we had quite a few uh, politicians in Germany who got, had a PhD degree. And they got it the easy way, in particular in humanities. It doesn't affect our, our field so much, but there were eager beavers, self-appointed controllers analyzed the thesis and he paid her it and they lost then there was big scandals, a big press coverage and so on and so on. Now, appropriate, inappropriate uh, data sampling statistics. Um, again, let me just be fast. Let me give you one. Um, actually, I might actually want to skip over this for the lack of time. And let me just home in on this one. What you see very often so is, yeah. So Reinhard, uh, would it be possible for you to wrap up in two minutes? So we are running out of time. Um, yeah, I realized that I was, yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, I see yeah. that. Okay, let, let me just, um, sure, I, can sure. do, I can do two minutes. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. One thing is, first of all, one of the big mistakes is doing statistics on small numbers. That is bullshit. Never, ever do this. Never, ever use significance calculations based on n equals three, four, or five. This is not correct. The only way to display such data, if you cannot do more experiment, is using these kind of diagrams. And everyone, every referee, can see what type of data you have. And if you do any statistics, and you see here there's an outlier here, and then every reviewer can, uh, can see wh what the data are because we all are in the same boat. But what is obviously completely wrong, but some people do, well, this is an outlier, I just take it out. You, unless you have very good reasons and proven reasons why you can take out this outlier, you cannot do this. And this is another thing which is sin, which is actually quite often being done by people. Now, let me, uh, the scientific images, there's also what we call beautification. I give you two examples here. This is a paper uh, figure published in science. It looks pretty good. But what has been done here, if you do the forensic analysis, that these cells were moved to a different position because the figure this was actually more sparse. Now, there's nothing wrong with the content of the figure, but it's not the figure uh, which you originally saw in the microscope. And this is actually not legitimate, and it's called beautification. And other things are, for instance, contrast gambles. You know, you have this kind of fake, these, these kind of dirt bands and so on, and you, you clean them up, and this is also not legitimate. So the rules for, for figures are all operations must affect the whole image, not part of it. Linear range must cover the weakest and strongest signals. Nonlinear conversions are not allowed. And all data analysis involving thresholding, filtering, noise reduction, whatever, needs justification. And you need to have the original data at hand if someone wants to know it. And also combination of different panels must be indicated. And if I can give you any advice, ban Photoshop from your lab, only use quantitative, quantifiable software for image analysis. Now, the final points I wanted to make is the misuse of citation counts, impact factors, and other metrics. I could spend a whole hour to talk about this. Give you, let, let's give, you, let me give you two examples. One is now three papers, all highly cited, a nature paper, you know, with thousand citations, one in a little bit biochemistry with 200,000 citations, the third most highly quoted papers of all times. You might think this should win the Nobel Prize in another paper of uh, about a thousand citations. If you look at the Nobel Prize, this one won the Nobel Prize. This was the invention of patch clamping. Um, this is the Kumasi Blue Qu Protein Quantification Essay. It's a method essay. And all what Marion Bradford did was actually adapt an essay which was used for gel stainings to a solution stain, and that was it. And that is one of the most highly quoted papers of all times. And this is one of my own papers, which was an important paper, the crystal structure of the snare complex, but clearly not even close to the Nobel Prize. Now, another example, and this is my previous almost last slide, Acta Crystallographica, specialist term, impact factor for many years and now between two and three. In 2007, 2008, the impact factor rose to 49.6, higher than science, cell, or any nature journal to return to about three in the following years. 
The reason was a single paper from my own place describing an uptake of a basic program for structure determination, shellx, which hit so many quotations, because everyone using this software had to quote that paper that the impact factor of us sectors to South Africa so through the sky. Now, the conclusion is the impact factor. We have this uh, discussion right afterwards. This, I think is very timely for the DOA, uh, DORA discussion. The impact factor does not tell you anything about the quality of an individual paper. Um, and we will, uh, you have, um, I didn't know this, that you have a DORA discussion right afterwards. It's, so it's very good preparation. And the percentage of papers published in Nature that are never cited is well as double digits. And uh, during my time as uh, in, the, in the EMBO Publication Advisory Board, the EMBO editors pointed out with some glee that the, pay, the percentage of papers never, pub, uh, never quoted in Nature is much higher than in EMBO Journal. And on that note, I would like to conclude and uh, say basically be very cautious when using such metrics for evaluating the quality of science of scientists and be ready to fight the abuse of counting impact factor points. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Reinhardt, for a wonderful talk. And of course, it's very relevant, but yet uh, I think someday people tend not to put a lot of focus on these very critical points. So we have uh, several questions, but in the interest of time, maybe I'll just uh, take a few. Uh, just, uh, so the first question that uh, has been asked by Ganesh Papat, and a very interesting question that, how does one, especially young PIs, tackle requests from expert researchers or senior collaborators to add their names or the lab managers or students in the manuscript just before the submission? Sometimes they're creating a very awkward situation, perhaps. Yeah, this is, um, there's no simple answer to this. I mean, generally speaking, the answer, uh, I mean, the point is that uh, the rule is uh, there has to be a significant scientific contribution to the content of the paper. Now, in the case of a collaboration, this is complicated because you might have a postdoc with whom you're collaborating and that means you have, in, in addition to the Indian, you might have three chiefs on the paper. And this is something you should discuss beforehand. In your own, I mean, if you have a boss whom we have never seen, but wants to be in the paper, this is a dicey situation because you are dependent. And uh, in principle, it's not legitimate. And if you, I would just, in this pay, uh, case, I would kind of cautiously inquire whether there's an ombud system or complaint system and try to settle it. But obviously you are in a tight spot because you might be dependent on the senior for your own career. And, in, uh, and, and uh, it depends on the local situation. So for instance, at the graduate school, we, we had thesis advisory committees who, who were protecting the students for the, from this happening, but uh, it's a problem you should be aware of. And there is no, sometimes there may be no easy solutions for that. Thanks a lot. So there is another uh, pretty, I would say that this is also a very tricky question. So this is a question asked by Veda Krishnan, and he's asking in this age of instant gratification or career being judged based on publication as well as through publication driven accolades, how can we develop ethical behavioral changes in such a situation? Any tips? Well, that's again, um, not, there's no easy answer. I mean, I think if um, in institutions which really look at scientific quality, um, you have actually less of that problem. For instance, I am, uh, since uh, quite a few years, I'm chairman of, an, of a grant review panel of the European Research Council, and I also was working on, on NIH and NSF panels. And there you really look at the scientific content of the work. So I remember, for instance, um, uh, awarding an ERC grant to someone who has never published in a, in a journal with a high impact in journal of bacteriology, because this was very specialized, but extremely high quality a science on a somewhat more exotic material species, whereas others coming up as one or two nature papers didn't make it. I mean, it was an extreme case, but in a, in a way you really, I mean, there's only one way around and this is to look at the content of the science. And I think just doing metrics, and again, I mean, it will lead us to the next discussion so we can cut this short, is not a good measure. And I think, uh, unfortunately, I know that appointment panels, when you apply for jobs, this might hit you. So you cannot completely ignore that pressure. Yeah? But you have to try to, you know, uh, um, publish your science well in the highest possible pace, place. But uh, uh, you have to, on the other hand, also see what uh, what what the current conditions are in, in your particular environment. Okay. So we'll take one last uh, question, and this is this can be a live question. So uh, there's a question by Anil. So Anil, would you want to go live and ask the question? Uh, yes. 
Please. Hi, Reinhardt. Uh, greetings from uh, Magdeburg. I'm a student of Eckhart Gundelfinger. So, okay. Person, uh, so uh, I just want to ask you, what is, what is your main criteria when you uh, select a PhD student or a postdoc, uh, apart from a very good CV uh, at the lab uh, or uh, institute uh, where he comes from? So what is your main uh, like criteria? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, we interview students and I also make sure that they talk to the lab members, you know, because I mean, very often, I mean, in bo- it goes both ways. I mean, first of all, my lab members want to know whether they get along with a student or, um, um, or postdoc candidate, whether they, they, the chemistry is right, and they also have their own impression. And also for the applicant, it's good to know to talk to my people to see what type of boss I am, because I mean, they're obviously spending the next years in my group, and they want to make sure that they don't make a mistake this way. So... So this um, is, uh, and then they usually give a talk. I mean, if they are postdocs and based on all these factors, it become uh, essential to the decision, which I'm not taking alone, but I usually reflect it with my group. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Thank you.